Good morning. Good morning. So uh, I've prepared something special for you this morning. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a ride. And so since I'm going to be asking you to bear with me, I want to tell you from the get-go where I'm going so that there won't be a point where you're like, where is he going with this? He's using a bunch of weird languages and I don't know what this is about. Here's the point. So you'll know and you'll be like, what's this about? This is what it's about. The sermon this morning is going to be a defense of the intellectual side of Christianity. I want to spend this time on Theological Education Sunday to celebrate the life of the mind and celebrate the ways in which Jesus has lifted up using your whole brain to love God. Um, I think it's something that we've actually underemphasized a lot in the church. Luckily, you guys can handle it because you're Presbyterians. The Presbyterians among Christians have had a strong tradition of it. Um, but, but still, it's something that maybe you just implicitly, just when you don't think about it, feel like, well, but emotions are more spiritual, though. Right? It's, just, it's holier to focus on love than to focus on thinking really hard. Um, and I notice, I notice we have the kids with us today. And, and there was some talk about zombies. So there was a joke I cut, but I want to mention it. Um, I, I was watching this, uh, it, it was actually a song, and he was talking about zombies. And the premise was, what if uh, regular office workers had, been, had become zombies? And, and what would their conversation be? And, and he, he sort of did this presentation of a, a, a courteous, cutthroat business zombie saying, now, now let's be reasonable. All we want to do is, is eat your brains, okay? Let's, let's compromise, all right? No one's going to eat your eyes. We just open up the door, and we'll come in, and we'll eat your brains. You saw that? Yeah, it's a funny thing. But guys, it's also important, because I think that there are people out there in the world, people who need the love of God, and people who see the Christians as a group that's very nice, that's very courteous, but that wants to eat their brains. That wants to say, you know what, if you just put your brain away, then you can come be part of our community. And that's not the offer that Jesus made. Jesus said, your brain is a part of this. I want your brain too. So we're going to talk about it this morning, and I'm going to show it to you in scripture, but I'm also going to model it. So this is going to be a nerdy sermon. Buckle up. All right. You might think this passage, why did I choose this passage? This isn't the lectionary, Mark 12. This seems like a lovey-dovey passage, doesn't it? There's love over and over again. It's fuzzy. Love your neighbor as yourself. But I don't, uh, I don't think, I, I, well, at least I don't look at it that way. When I come from seminary, this to me is an example of the time that Jesus translated Greek and Hebrew. It seems like a strange thing, right? In the modern 21st century, we've got great translations of scriptures. Why are we still sending kids to these institutions to learn to speak ancient languages that nobody speaks anymore? Just, just use the translation in your Bible. Well, one of the main reasons, I think, is because Jesus did it. The scribes, they're arguing, and they, they love theological debate, and they're, they're disagreeing with each other, and they're like, hey, Jesus, why don't you answer just a theological curiosity? What, which commandment is the most important? Which is first of all the commandments in the Old Testament? And Jesus quotes a prayer. He quotes a prayer that would have been recited by every Jewish boy and every Jewish girl every morning and every evening. It goes like this. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Achivata et Adonai Elochecha, Begol Lebabeka, Uvekal Nabseka, Uvekal Meodka. Now don't worry, I do translate. <laughs> Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohenu means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. It, it, it's actually, it's the Lord y'all's God. It's in the austerest tense. Um, it's the, the Lord, you plurals God, Adonai Echad. The Lord is one. And actually, just a little extra nerdiness for a minute. Eloheinu is plural. It's kind of like the word Dios. So it's actually saying the Lord, y'all's gods are one. So that we get this like Trinitarian moment in the Old Testament here, right? He's saying all the three gods, they're one. Anyway, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Check it out. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. The Lord our God is one. 
Ve'achevata, and love Adonai Elohecha, love the Lord your God. Now I'm, now I'm commanding you, now it's imperative tense. Love the Lord your God, Ve'achevata Adonai Elohecha, Bekal Levaveka, Uvekal Nabseka, Uvekal Meodka, in three ways. And we translate it heart, uh, soul, and strength. But you got to do a little bit of work there. See, because levaveka, your heart, um, it's, it's true, it, does, it means your, your literal heart muscle. But in Hebrew, you didn't write love letters that would say, I love you with all of my heart. You would actually say, I love you with all of my intestines. And that's, that's in the Song of Solomon, we talk about that, right? The seat of emotions was the gut, which makes sense if you think about it. I mean, it's no more arbitrary than the heart. We say we have emotions in the heart, but um, for the ancient Hebrews, the heart was more of the seat of thinking. It was more where I make decisions. It was my will. So he says, love the Lord your God with what we would say your brain. Now, that's, that's really fun because there's parts in the Old Testament. I mean, we adjusted that into our language where we talk about things that we know by heart, right? Or we say to God, search me and know my heart. That's my luvav. Search me and know the thing that I make decisions with. Then he says, love the Lord your God with all your nabsecha. Now, what's a nabsecha? Well, that, that's like a spirit. It's not the same word, ruach, that's used for the Holy Spirit. It's kind of your, yourself. Uh, the, the thinking was that you are not a body. You have a body. A body is something that, that you own. If, if I cut off your hand, there's not less you. You're, you're still you. There's less of a body. You own less of a hand. Um, so the napseka is the you. It's the thing that has your body. Um, your non-physical self, and it's also associated with emotion. So you should love the Lord your God with your thinking and with your emotions. And then they have a really fun word. Love the Lord your God with all your meodka. Now meod is a very common word in Hebrew. It means muy. It means a lot. You use it all the time. Uh, we, we talk about... Uh, God created the world and it was very good. Tov meod, tov meod, over and over again. Meod, very common. But this is a noun. Love the Lord your God with all of your allotness. Love the Lord your God with your muchness. Um, so we translate that strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength all of everything that you have. That's the prayer that Jesus quotes when he says, now this is the greatest commandments from Deuteronomy 6.4. He also quotes, I should mention also from the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, this is the greatest commandment. And he's combining the two. So you should love your neighbor as yourself in these ways, with your heart, with your mind, with your strength. The only problem is Jesus is in the New Testament. What, what language is the New Testament written in? Greek. He's, he's probably speaking Aramaic, and, and yeah, it's written in Greek. So he's got to find a way to render this idea, this idea that has all of these intricacies in Hebrew, into Greek. And the first thing he does is he changes the tense. He makes it nosotros. So it's no longer love y'all's God. It's love our God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, all of ours. The Lord is one. Now, you again, love the Lord your God. And he uses four words. He adds one. Because he doesn't feel he can render the fullness of this idea that comes through three Hebrew words in just three Greek words. The Greeks are more specific. So he says, love him with all your heart, kardias. Now that's, again, that's, that's the literal heart muscle, and it's more associated with emotions than it was in Hebrew, but not completely. Our, when we talk about hearts in, uh, in, in English or Spanish, we're much more emotional about it. Um, is, so he, he puts Guardius in there. He says, love the Lord your God with all your soul, suke. Now, 
Greek is fun, right? You probably know uh, cardias because you've heard of cardiology, right? You probably know suke because you've heard of psychiatry or psychology. Love the Lord your God with all of your psyche. And that still translates to soul or spirit, but it also translates to psyche. It could translate to mind. It's again, it's the you that has your body, but you can feel that it's, it's already, it's much more associated with the mind. It's much more intellectual. Jesus ch chooses this translation. He had other choices. He chose this one. And then he says, love the Lord your God with all of your mind. Dianoia. D is a prefix. It means two. Love the Lord your God with both lobes of your brain. Um, that, that's literally how it renders. Love him with your brain, with your critical thinking, with your well-thought-out ideas. Jesus finds it fit to add that to the Shema, to this famous prayer that everyone has memorized. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai And then finally, love the Lord your God with all your iskus, with all of your power and all of your might. There was a translation that existed of the Hebrew scriptures, of Deuteronomy 6.4. Jesus didn't use it. He changed the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, and made it more intellectual. He added dianoia to it. He changed dunamos to ixus. He, it, it wasn't just with all your you know, emotions and all your soul and, and everything else. He instead made it, make sure you love God with your emotions and your decision making and your critical thinking and your physical strength. Why did he do that? Why was that so important to Jesus? I mean, if you think about it in context, it was the perfect time to not do that. He could have slammed those scribes to the pavement. They were sitting there arguing about theological minutia. Imagine if, if they had said to him, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, well, the greatest commandment is Psalm 133. How blessed it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. Why don't you all just stop arguing and get along and love one another? But he doesn't say that. He says, use all of your rational faculties. This traditional prayer, this says mind, this says heart, this says decision making. Maybe it's because Jesus already knew an answer, uh, knew how important it would be to give an answer to anyone that asketh you the reason for the hope that is in you. 1 Peter 3.15. I mean, Jesus is in this position being asked hard questions by doubters. He knows that people who follow his way are going to need to be able to answer hard questions. And to do that, we're going to need to be able to think hard. Maybe it's because Jesus knows the importance of the mind in guiding actions. Philippians 4.8 says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Think about such things. It uses a Greek word that's literally rendered logic, logosai, about such things. Don't just let your mind wander emotionally into those things. Really work on them. That's important to the spiritual life. Maybe he even knew uh, the, the importance of the, the thinking part of the hearts in the Old Testament. I've hidden your word in my heart. For things like faith, for things like orthodoxy, for things like teaching, we need to engage our brains fully in the intellectual pursuits of Christ. And we need people who are trained, who are academically gifted, who have spent time working hard on these things to serve our communities with that important gift. But before I can finish today, I have to talk about love. So often, love is put against logic. They're, they're made to seem in conflict. They're, they're made to say, well, yeah, that's a, that's a very fine argument. That's, that's a lot of thinking you've done. I've seen you've done your research. But what about love? And friends, this sermon this morning is not to tell you that logic is more important than love. This sermon is to tell you that Jesus says, loving God with all your mind, the use of your mind 
is a means of love. The mind is a way to love. It's not against love. And we need to love our neighbor as ourselves with all our heart and all our psyche and all of our critical thinking and all of our physical strength as well. We need to love our neighbor in the same way we're called to love. Love God and love others with all your mind. Don't reduce that. So thank you all. Thank you for the ways that you have loved me, that you have, as a member of the corporate body of the Presbyterian Church, recognized my gifts for thinking, recognized my gifts for the intellectual pursuits, and helped me to achieve that. You, by celebrating me, by holding a Theological Education Sunday and inviting me here, have participated in loving God with all your mind, and I hope that you'll continue to do that. So that when people tell you, yeah, don't, don't worry too much about that scripture that bothers you, just try not to think about it, think about uh, that God loves you no matter what. Just tell them, well, God loves me and loves my mind. Amen. Yeah.